Hey guys, Walls here with a short story literary elements review. Let's go over some of the big terms we've been talking about this semester so far. Come on now, there we go. All right, so the first thing we need to do is come to terms with our literary elements. We're talking about plot, setting, character, and theme. Those are kind of the, uh, the main ingredients of a story. Uh, and uh, the first three, plot, setting, and character, are always like explicitly created and uh, they're put there by the author. Like it wouldn't be a story without any one of those things. Now theme, maybe optional. I personally think that we can get theme from almost anything we read, uh, a big idea, but uh, we'll, or we'll talk a more about that uh, later. First, let's talk about plot. Now, you can't really have a short story without plot. Plot is what happens. So the major elements of plot are always going to be your exposition, which kind of sets the stage, uh, tells us who's involved, who the players are in the story. You've got your rising action, which introduces the conflict. And I always like to try to pinpoint the specific event or thing that happens that kicks off the rising action. So let's think about Lamb to the Slaughter as an example. We read that uh, first, that was the first story we read this term. Uh, so in Lamb to the Slaughter, the exposition shows us Mary sitting at home waiting for Patrick to get there. Uh, she's a dutiful housewife. And uh, the, the tension, the conflict uh, kicks off when Patrick gets home and starts acting or behaving differently. Uh, so that's, the, that's kind of the thing that gets the, the plot going. The climax is the turning point of the story. It's kind of like the point of no return. The protagonist uh, can only go one of two ways at this point. It's like the most important part of the story in general. Uh, then the falling action is the direct aftermath of the climax. What's happening to the characters because of what happened in the climax. And the resolution is how things finally wrap up. Now let's look at a basic plot map here. This is for uh, Contents of the uh, Dead Man's Pocket by Tom Finney. So here we see I've got our protagonist and our antagonist as Tom. Uh, we talked at the beginning of the term about how the protagonist is the main character of the story, not necessarily the good guy. And the antagonist of the story is the person or force working against the protagonist. I mean, basically here in this story, Tom is his own worst enemy. So the, the foreshadow, or excuse me, I'm not talking about foreshadowing yet. The, uh, the rising act, nope. The exposition it shows us Tom and Claire talking about going to the movies. Claire leaves and Tom stays because he says he has to work. So, you know, you've got this uh, interaction between the two characters here that does kind of set up an internal conflict for Tom. Tom is struggling, you know, do I go to work or, or do I do my work that I don't really have to do but I want to do? Or do I go to the movies with my wife? The, the event that kicks everything off, that gets the whole story going as the paper goes out the window, most of the story is going to be rising action here uh, because it's, it's, the focus is on Tom spending several minutes on that ledge. And we know that Tom only spends, you know, he just spends several minutes on that ledge, even though it takes us what seems like forever to read the story. Uh, my read aloud of the story is close to 30 minutes long, something like that. But the story technically only takes place in like 10 whole minutes. Uh, so a lot of focus goes on uh, in the rising action. So we don't want to think of the uh, the climax of the story is always in the middle. Uh, sometimes stories spend a lot of time on the rising action to build suspense, and then boom, the climax happens, and we're like, ah! And sometimes, like in Land of the Slaughter, the climax of the story happens very early because the suspense isn't seeing what's going to happen. The suspense is seeing how the characters react to what happened, if that makes sense. So the, I put the climax in this story as Tom breaks the window and gets inside. So you know, if you think back to the story, there's that moment where Tom has his fist pulled back and he's like, okay, I'm going to punch this window and either I get into this apartment or I don't. And if he doesn't, it's, it's game over for Tom. So Tom, uh, he gets inside, he puts the paper on the desk and he goes to meet Claire. Uh, and then and now the resolution is key here. When we do, uh, when we when we talk about a story's plot, and especially how that plot relates to the bigger meaning or theme, we have to make sure we talk about all of it. So you want to talk about the whole story. How does all of Tom's crazy ride here uh, connect to the larger theme of the story? Because what happens is when the pay, when Tom leaves to go see his wife, the paper goes back out the window, and it's key that we note that Tom laughs on his way out. So the resolution is literally the last thing that happens in the story. Okay, uh, let's move on here. Uh, yeah, let's talk about foreshadowing and flashback. So authors manipulate uh, the timeline. They manipulate our perception of time in a story using foreshadowing and flashback. Now, foreshadowing is when the author gives us clues as to what is about to happen. Now, take note that foreshadowed events don't have to happen. 
the, a lot of foreshadowing takes place in uh, contents of the dead man's pocket because uh, we, we're constantly being told in a, in a way or hinted at that the, uh, the main character is going to fall off the ledge and be the dead man with the contents of the pocket. Uh, but that doesn't actually happen. Spoiler alert. Uh, so the flashback, though, flashback is interesting here. Uh, oh, what are we talking about here? I had thoughts on this one. I think I wanted to focus on how a lot of the foreshadowing is in rising action, but I think I covered that in the previous slide with this thing. All right, let's talk about flashback. So uh, one of my favorite examples of flashback is in An Astrologer's Day. So when the first time I read Ast An Astrologer's Day, I was like, hey, that's a cool story. Uh, but the second time I read it, I noticed this part in particular. So there's a passage in the story where the astrologer is just kind of, or the, the narrator is going over how the astrologer ended up doing what he's doing. And you get to this part where he says, there he would have carried on the work of his forefathers, namely tilling the land, living, marrying, and ripening in his cornfield and ancestral home. But that was not to be. He had to leave home without telling anyone, and he could not rest till he left it behind a couple of hundred miles. So you've got this little thing that doesn't seem like a major detail when you first read it, but when you get to the end of the story, it makes sense. And so this example of flashback serves to give us a clearer picture of why the astrologer is where he is now, but it also kind of acts like foreshadowing, because when you read this, you're like, huh, I wonder why he had to leave so suddenly. The author doesn't really tell us. Uh, so, you know, foreshadowing and flashback are used to manipulate the uh, the reader's sense of time in a story, and it's to get us to either anticipate what's going to happen or give us information about the past, the character's past, that helps us better understand what's going on now. All right, now, conflict or no conflict, no plot. So we're going to talk here about how uh, or different types of conflict and how they affect the story. And, and the part of your comparison questions for these stories focuses on conflict. Uh, conflict is a very important element of the story. And you've got two main types. You've got external and internal conflict. So external conflicts take place outside of the protagonist. If you're the protagonist, your external conflict is taking place out there somewhere. If you're, if you're the protagonist and you're experiencing an internal conflict, it's happening in here, okay? So uh, person versus person is one of the most basic and famous and you know useful all around types of external conflict. So you can have either a physical art altercation or a verbal altercation or a mix of the two, but basically two people, two or more people come into conflict and that conflict has to be resolved. A uh, famous example, you've got Batman and the Joker here. They're constantly coming into conflict. Um, I love this particular photo uh, because it kind of looks like, uh, I don't know, like Batman's the principal, and the Joker's in trouble for like causing mayhem. Anyways, uh, then you've got person versus society. Again, this is still external. It still involves a person uh, coming into conflict with uh, something outside of his or her control. But in this case, it's society. It's people in general. And um, I asked some students to give me examples of this in film today in class. And one student brought up, um, remember the Titans? Because the coach here, I mean, it's a football uh, movie essentially that you know that's that's a great example of external conflict of football team versus a football team but it also highlights the coach's battle against the societal expectations and uh, beliefs and values at the time and in the place he was uh, he had to stand up against the societal views at the time so you have the coach taking a stand against society in general and also you have person versus person conflict in in, in the the story as well all right what else we got person versus nature now this can be like Nature in general or nature specifically? Here you've got two examples from uh, some of my favorite movies. You've got uh, the protagonist in the Jurassic Park going up against a T-Rex and the protagonist in Jaws going up against a shark. Uh, but you can also have examples of um, people going up against nature in general. Like uh, what's the movie with The Rock where uh, like The Rock ran out of stuff to fight so they made him fight the Earth? Uh, San Andreas, yeah, yeah, where it's like a natural disaster. Twister is another classic example of a natural disaster film. So person versus nature is another important or significant example of external conflict. Okay, internal conflict. I'm calling back to Jaws here uh, because a lot of times you know, in stories, you're not just going to have one or the other. I think you could argue that like you might have primarily an external conflict, but there's always going to be an internal conflict as well. And in Jaws, one of the major internal conflicts was with Sheriff Brody. Sheriff Brody knew there was a shark out there that was, that was nomming on people. And he was thinking, I got to close these beaches. But he was also uh, being trying to be persuaded by uh, the mayor to keep the beaches open because the mayor was concerned about the economic well-being of the island. The island depended upon 
summer visitors to make it through the winter. So you close down the beaches and that just creates more problems. So Brody had this, this internal conflict. What is the right thing to do here? And he had to go through that in his head while experiencing external conflicts like arguing with the mayor and eventually um, almost being eaten by a shark. Spoiler alert. Okay, uh, let's go on to examples. All right, let's tie it into the stories we've read recently. So uh, all of these stories kind of had the same vibe to me. The uh, an Astrologer's Day, Contents of the Dead Man's Pocket, and um, Civil Peace. Uh, because you basically have uh, guys trying to do what they got to do to get through a work day while also experiencing different types of conflict. Now, external examples. You've got the Astrologer versus Guru Nayak. So the astrologer literally came into conflict with Guru Nayak in that story. It was a life or death situation. If Guru Nayak had discovered who the astrologer was, uh, the Guru Nayak would have tried to kill him. Now, then you've got Tom versus the ledge. Now, the ledge can't literally fight back against Tom, but Tom was stuck on that ledge. Uh, he was kind of almost man versus nature. The wind was blowing. Uh, but the, uh, the, you know, then you've got Jonathan, Jonathan. You've got Jonathan versus the thieves in civil peace. That's a literal physical external conflict, Jonathan versus the thieves there. Now, um, you got to ask yourself, which which you know, wh which of these stories focuses most on external conflicts? I would argue that uh, the Astrologer's Day and Astrologer's Day and Civil Peace are primarily focused on external conflicts, where uh, Contents of the Dead Man's Pocket is primarily focused on internal conflicts. But that doesn't mean that you can't find examples of uh, internal conflicts in all of them. So the astrologer does express a little bit of fear and guilt and remorse uh, for what he's done. But again, I think the primary focus of that uh, that story was not on the astrologer's feelings about the altercation, but about the altercation itself. Now, uh, in uh, contents, I think Tom's fear and guilt is definitely the major conflict of the story. You know, right at the end of the, right at the beginning of the story. Tom uh, tells us basically that he has a guilty conscience. He's struggling. Do I stay home uh, and work on this stuff? I just lied to my wife and told her I had to get this work done when I really don't. And then what, the whole time he's on the ledge, he's, he's uh, racked with fear. He's struggling to keep his mind together. And then he has this revelation that uh, he has spent too much time focused on work and not enough time focused on what really matters. Um, and then in uh, Civil Peace, you've also got Jonathan uh, kind of fighting with himself, but it's it's less explicit. The author doesn't really give us a clear picture into Jonathan's mind. He just keeps saying over and over again um, how grateful he is and you know nothing puzzles God. Uh, but Jonathan does fight to remain positive. That could be an example of an internal conflict. But again, I think you've got uh, major examples of external conflict with the astrologer and Jonathan and a major example of um, internal conflict with um, Tom. But you might not see it that way, and that's cool. Uh, so when we get to the the, the questions, uh, the comparison questions, you know, just use this as your guide, but, you know, fight for your answer. If you've got a different uh, different take on this, that's okay. All right, setting. So you've got to have a, a conflict. You've got to have plot. You've got to have characters, and all of that takes place in a place in time, but not just a place in time. We've talked about how setting is also the customs, beliefs, and values of, of a time and place. So the customs are what the people in that time and place do. We've discussed how in the American South, it is customary to offer people hospitality. Like, you know, if you come visit my house, I'm going to offer you, uh, you know, sweet tea or something. Uh, beliefs and ideas. What are the beliefs and ideas that are popular or central to the identities of the people at the time? We talked about how uh, in the time period of um, Lamb of the Slaughter, um, science was very important. You had a very, very uh, specific um, push to make science a popular and important idea in society because, you know, everyone was in the Cold War, there was the space race, and all that stuff. Values. What do the, th what do the people of the time and place think is really important? And there are certain values that span all kinds of settings. I mean, it's hard to say that there hasn't been a time where people haven't valued hard work and family. Um, so, but, you know, you, you can, you know, the author here, you know, authors are going to either explicitly tell us this stuff but I would say eight times out of 10, when you start reading a book, you're going to pick up on these vibes based upon what the characters do and what the characters say and how the characters interact with one another. Um, and it also helps to, to redo a little bit of research. Um, you know, if you're going to read a book or a story that's set in 1950s America, Google it. What was 1950s America like? You know, uh, when we read uh, Civil Peace, uh, we'll talk about how um, the setting in that story, how the author set up the setting 
in that story was key to our understanding of it. Okay, so keep in mind that every short story we read is basically a snapshot in time. So you know the story begins and ends. It, it, it's not forever. It's just a like literal like a photograph. It's got borders around it. Uh, so if we understand the customs, beliefs, and values of that time period, it gives us a clear picture of what the story's actually about. So when we read contents of the dead man's pocket, we know at the time that there was a, a lot of societal pressure for men to be the best provider possible. So nowadays, if I lose a document, you know, like my, if I lose my math homework or like a, a student's paper that I'm trying to grade, I, I'm, no offense, but I'm not going to risk my life for it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect any of you to risk your life for anything you have made for my classroom. It's not that important, especially because nowadays, you know, it's all backed up in the cloud, you know? So what Tom does in content to the dead man's pocket might sound crazy to us, but if, if we were in his position, if we were a, a person in that time period reading that story even, we might find it more relatable. Now, think about an astrologer's day. You know, um, I personally don't necessarily believe that astrology is true. Um, but if I was living in the time period that that story takes place in that particular time and place, that setting, I might. So the astrologer is able to cheat his customers. The astrologer knows he's not an actual astrologer. He knows he doesn't. He can't tell people's futures. But he gets away with it in a sense because he knows that people believe that stuff. So the beliefs of the time play a huge role in the outcome of that story. And in civil peace, we talked about how you know we in the the beginning of the story where it talks about Chin, or the beginning of the packet where it talks about Chinway's Chinway Achebe's life. That context better helps us understand just how important what Jonathan is trying to do is. Um, you know, we know that there's been a civil war. We know that uh, society is crumbling, just like a lot of the buildings and houses. And uh, Jonathan's just trying to pick up the pieces and move on. And that's that's a touching story anytime, anytime throughout history. But it's especially touching because we know what Jonathan's been through in that civil war specifically. Now, uh, setting in general, you know, the time and place and customs, beliefs and values of a story is one thing. But then authors also use specific word choice to kind of give us a mood or a vibe about specific places. Uh, let's look at this example from Contents of the Dead Man's Pocket. I think a lot of what the author was trying to do here was give us very clear descriptions of the actual setting that Tom was in uh, so that it could help us better understand or kind of see through his eyes, be in his shoes. So this description is of what Tom sees when he's bent over double trying to pick up that piece of paper and he catches a glimpse of the, the cityscape, the city streets. And uh, this is what like causes him to lose it. So a lot of Tom's conflict um, is uh, made clearer to us because the author does a very good job of describing the setting. We have a very clear picture of what's happening. Now you go to an astrologer's day and the author does a very good job, again, of using descriptive language to um, kind of set the scene for us. And a lot of that story depends upon this idea of mis uh, mis mystery and mysticism. Uh, and so you've got this description here. You've got words like the en half the enchantment of the place, um, a bewildering crisscross of light rays and moving shadows. So a the author does a lot of work in an astrologer's day to set the mood with a description of the setting. So I would say that contents of the po uh, contents of the dead man's pocket in an astrologer's day focus very heavily on descriptive language to establish the setting, whereas in civil peace. We don't get a very descriptive passage at all of what stuff looks like, but we get a very clear picture in our heads of how people speak. And I think a lot of what Chinway Achebe was trying to do with this story is show how you can have two people in the same place who need and want the same things, but they're very different. Uh, so in that story, Jonathan, you know, you've got Jonathan Owegbu, his name, his first name is very Western culture and his, his last name, his surname is uh, more uh, African culture. And then here you've got uh, the thieves speaking to Jonathan and, and, and kind of broken and clipped and very, very uh, slang English almost. It's a very specific dialect. It's still English and Jonathan can still understand him and Jonathan can still communicate with the thieves, um, but it's very different. You can read it for yourself. I'm not going to try to give the accent. So in civil peace, Achebe uh, sets the scene, he, he, he establishes the setting through dialect and through character interaction more than description. Uh, so all of that goes into creating the setting, you know, physical descriptions, time and place, customs, beliefs and values, how the characters act, how the characters speak. Um, so it's not just a, 
you know, kind of a check a box kind of thing. Okay, the setting is this, the setting is this. You've really got to like study the vibe of the story. All right. So I'm getting a spam call here. All right, character. All right, here we go. So uh, we mainly learn about characters two ways, three ways, four ways. Actions, words, and thoughts. That comes from the characters themselves. And we can also observe the words and thoughts of other characters about them. So, and this is this is true in real life. I would argue that if you really wanted to know who someone is, look at the way they act. Then look at the, what the things they say. Now, you won't be able to tell what their thoughts are unless you're psychic, which, cool, good on you. Um, but then also, you know, you might ask other people, like, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? Uh, so uh, a lot of this is uh, direct. Uh, here you have an example of direct characterization. And this is when, when an author just tells us stuff. So in this passage... The author of An Astrologer's Day literally just tells us how the astrologer is shrewd and clever, and, and we don't have to do any guesswork here. But then you get to uh, this example of indirect characterization. So, you know, we don't, nothing here says that Tom has learned a valuable lesson and will never do this again. All we have to go on is Tom's actions. But based on his actions and the fact that he laughs, we, we can infer that he has learned a lesson and is grateful to be alive. So... Think of indirect and direct characterization as this. Direct characterization is when the author tells us something. Indirect characterization is when the author shows us something. Uh, and we'll talk more about inferences and, and, and that kind of what that is, what we're doing there later. So let's talk about theme, and then we're going to wrap it up. Theme is when a story has a larger meaning, a lesson for life. And one thing we're going to struggle with throughout our, our reading is are we reading a story that is just supposed to be a story? It's meant to entertain, or are we reading a story that is uh, that carries an, a message for us? And you guys answer this for the contents of the dead man po dead man's pocket. It brings up this concept of an allegory. In an allegory, the characters and the the situations aren't just what they look like. There's excuse me. There's deeper meaning. So Tom isn't just Tom Benecki in that story. Tom represents all of us who have wanted to succeed. And the paper isn't just a literal physical piece of paper with notes on it. The paper is what we think we really need to succeed. And the lesson we learn is, where should our priorities be? Uh, so you know, this, this question asks you to kind of wrestle with that. Do you think this was a, a, a story that was meant to have a meaning? Or do you think it was a story that was just meant to entertain? Uh, now, I would argue that theme is everywhere. This is a, the, the, the resolution of um, uh, an, astro an astrologer's day. And you know, there's no there's no vibe here that the the character has really learned a specific lesson, right? Uh, in fact, we can argue that he doesn't seem to have learned a lesson. He just says, "Time to go to sleep." He yawns and goes to sleep. But I do think that you know, you know, based upon the the experiences we've had in life, just as people, we can bring those to this story and and, and try to find a theme. So maybe the theme that you know, one of the themes that I take from this is uh, sometimes the past comes back. And, uh, you know, you got to appreciate the fact that, you know, what you do, uh, I guess, kind of a goes around, comes around vibe from this, um, even though technically, you know, if, if that's the if that's the thing, I guess the astrologer didn't really get what was coming to him, did he? I don't know. Anyways, that's what we're dealing with here, guys. Uh, so let's go back to the top here. So we reviewed all of this stuff. I know that's a lot uh, next week. Uh, we're going to review this stuff with some more. If you guys have any questions or concerns about any of this stuff, uh, let me know. Just make sure you understand what plot is and, and how conflict is, is central to the plot, the different types of conflict, uh, setting, how do authors establish setting, what, what are the elements of setting, character, what's the difference between indirect and direct characterization, how do authors reveal character, theme, um, what's the message that the author is trying to portray. If there isn't a message, what could you assume might be the message? Uh, and we're going to get more in-depth in this stuff as we go through the term. Um, but, uh, yeah, hope you guys have a good one, and I'll talk to you again soon.